This program was made possible by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University. We welcome you to another in our continuing series of discussions about the standard works of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, specifically the New Testament and the Four Gospels. Joining me in our discussion this session are members of the Faculty of Religious Education. To my far left, Professor Brent L. Topp, Professor of Church History and Doctrine at Brigham Young University, Professor Camille Franck, Professor of Ancient Scripture at BYU, Professor Paul Hoskison, also of Ancient Scripture at BYU, and I'm Andrew Skinner. Last time we had uh, a wonderful discussion about the premortal status of Jesus Christ, Jehovah come to earth as the baby Jesus, and uh, we have, I think, to begin our discussion today a wonderful capstone summary of all that uh, we have said in past discussions and past sessions about the premortal stature of the Lord Jesus Christ. And this is found in the fourth gospel, the Gospel of John. And as you know, John writes a prologue, or I guess we could say an introduction to uh, his gospel, in which he quotes uh, large chunks from John the Baptist, who in fact was probably his mentor, and uh, I thought it would be a, a kind of a springboard, a way for us to not only recap or summarize what we discussed in our last session about the premortal stature of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, but also to propel us then into a discussion of the uh, culture and the historical circumstances that form the background of the four Gospels. So if you will turn with me to John chapter 1, uh, we can take a look at John's uh, prologue, or I guess we could uh, say his introduction. Brent, would you, would you like to read for us the first three verses and make any comments about those verses that you deem appropriate? In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. What thoughts come to mind? Well, a note that I have written here, a couple of things. We, we already talked about in the beginning. We talked about that. We talked about the creative part. But I, I love that word, Word. Uh, and I had just written right there is uh, that uh, as we look in the Joseph Smith translation, we get a little bit of clarification in that regard as well. But there's a beautiful passage also on in Revelation chapter 19 where John tells us, the other John, John the Revelator, tells us, uh, um, not John the Baptist, but John the Apostle, of whose gospel we are also reading, speaks of Christ as the Word of God or the Word of Salvation as well. And so I think, that, I think that's interesting, too, is that uh, in the beginning was the Word, meaning Christ as the messenger of salvation, mediator. the mediator of salvation. Thank you. What's the language that's used in the Doctrine and Covenants? Isn't it that language that you just quoted? He is the messenger of, of salvation. Uh, it seems to me that this word is pretty packed with, uh, with significant meaning. He is, he's the executor if you will, of the Father's plan. He's the messenger of salvation. He's the one in whom our salvation centers. Um, he is the agent, or um, I, I'm thinking here of the, of the Spanish translation of this, and I think uh, in place of word, doesn't the Spanish translation use the word verb? He is the verb oh. for God. In other words, he's the active mm -hmm. power behind the, the plan of salvation. Of course, the word here uh, in the Greek text is logos, which carries with it all of this baggage that we've been talking mm -hmm. about, 
of, of uh, organization, of power, and it conveys the concept of speaking and things happen, of speaking and things are created. And this is a concept which uh, predates the, the, the Greeks, of course. This was a concept which was around in the ancient Near East. It was a concept that would have been available uh, to the ancient Israelites. Mm. And so John here is bridging actually two worlds by using this. He's bridging the, the Hellenistic world that, uh, that uh, had used this and developed this concept of the Logos Philosophical. philosophically and the ancient um, Near Eastern world that had developed this, the, 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 the idea of this, not, not the philosophy of it, but the, the concept of the word being the organizational power the the word being spoken and things happen uh, th these concepts are in the the most ancient of all literatures in the world you know it, it takes on a, a significance in that passage of john the revelator that i just mentioned to you in revelation 19 look at this phrase in verse 13 and, and john is seeing the savior in vision here and he says and he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood you see the symbolism there and his name is called the word of god now that's Revelation. That's Revelation 19, 19 verse 13. And, and, then he, and it says, and then the, uh, for Latter day Saints, it has a particular interesting nuance here where it says, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And so we see the rod of iron being the Word of God, and the Word of God is much more than just the standard yeah. works. It's Christ, the Word that is made flesh. Well, that, that's, that's pretty neat because we know that John the Revelator saw the same vision that Nephi saw and that Lehi saw, and we go, get a lot of the same images and a lot of the same uh, verbiage, in fact. We get a tree of life in the book of Revelation, and in 1 Nephi we get the, the rod of iron mentioned here. It gives you a, a distinct impression that somebody else is behind this besides just a, a bunch of secular authors here. That's pretty, that is pretty significant. Uh, I'm going to take us back to uh, the, John's prologue, the introduction to the Gospel of John, because I think there are a couple of other things that are exciting to point out. Uh, John tips his hand a little bit in terms of a theme that uh, he, will, he will continue to talk about uh, throughout his Gospel. He mentions this in chapter 1, verses 4 and 5, and that's the theme of light. John seems to me to be obsessed with this attribute of the Savior. This is the, the light that came into the world. He says in verse 4, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. He'll, correct me if I'm wrong, Camille, but doesn't he follow through on this theme several times in different mm -hmm. chapters where he keeps coming back to the theme that the Savior is the light of the world, the light of men, that you know, life is dependent on light, and our life, is dependent upon the Savior. Not only in his gospel, but you also see it again later in his epistle as well. Light and life as an a, a ongoing theme of the nature of the saving power of Christ. Mm -hmm. And continues on as your footnote shows you in your LDS edition into the Doctrine and Covenants where this exact same language is used by the Lord again to describe the Savior. And I believe yeah. it's far more literal than we often take it. Well, that seems to be the... the um, the connotation in section 88 uh, where it talks about the way that light is such an integral part of the physical universe and of course it all centers on the Lord Jesus Christ so I think you're right the Savior is f not just spiritually but physically tangibly a part of this universe the physics of the universe is more bound up in the Savior than we have any idea of. this is just off the wall just throw it out for you but as you think about that, and light, and life, and I think we'd throw another L word in there too, love. You put all those together, it's no wonder that we speak of uh, the fate of sons and perdition as outer darkness, darkness. The, uh, the total devoid absence of, of light. light. Absolutely. Yes. Well, and, and again, this, this same theme, verse 9 in chapter 1, that was the true light which lighteth every man not to, to beat the horse to death, but this is a theme to watch out for as we take a look at John's gospel because it'll surface and surface and resurface. John is obsessed with this. I mean, obsessed maybe isn't the right word. He wants us to understand. Well, there's that whole idea of dichotomy yeah. where the, the opposites, and, and he shows it in blind and seeing. I mean, exactly. how, when you have light, you can see, and when you choose to as Nicodemus does, to turn from the light, um, he yes, does not I, see. And I think that is brought up, as you mentioned there, uh, Camille, in verse 5, the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehendeth it not. I'm wondering if 
uh, the Savior is the light. He's the one who shines here in mortality because it's, he's leading into his mortal birth here. And, and the world does not comprehend him or the message in general yeah, so of what he brings. So in other words, this isn't just the Jewish people. No. This is much, there's a much broader principle that John is teaching. He's, John says in verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He's trying to give us a sense of his eyewitness testimony of the physical reality of the living Savior that was among them. We beheld his glory. In other words, we, we know that the glory that he possessed was the glory that he had in, uh, in pre-mortality with our Father in Heaven. But they didn't see that on a regular basis. That was a specialized circumstance. Uh, yeah. Otherwise, it's as Isaiah said, there was no comeliness that we should desire yeah. Him. And it took something more of spirit to detect who He was, even before you see it in a graphic way like they did on the Mount of That's Transfiguration. But, yes. but I think that also leads into a little bit of a historical discussion because of, of their messianic expectation that the historical circumstances and culture in which they find themselves cause them to, as Jacob would say in the Book of Mormon, look beyond the mark because they're looking for something different in a way. Well, in fact, what, what are uh, the Israelites or the Jews looking for in the Meridian Dispensation? What kind of a Messiah are they expecting? One who is coming to save them, specifically the House of Israel, were the only ones that his, his atonement, his, his um, goodness would cover and it would come swiftly. So, so, so it's narrowed in terms of the number of people mm -hmm. that, that he is going to save. But, but there's also, I think, a, another physical dimension to the kind of expectation that they have, aren't there? I think we need to back up in history a little bit at this point and, and uh, uh, start with the, uh, with the Babylonian captivity, uh, which ends around 539 B.C., a good 500 years before Christ is born, and the decree of Cyrus that the, the Jewish people can go home. Some of them went home and uh, founded... Operative word, some. Some went home and founded the, the later state uh, uh, of the Jewish state there. But they were still under uh, Persian. Persian domination for a little more than 200 years. And then along came Alexander the Great, who uh, uh, captured uh, Jerusalem, or at least incorporated the land of Judah into the, uh, uh, his empire around 332 B.C. And when Alexander died and his empire began to fall apart into those four sections that the book of Daniel talks about, the, the one kingdom in Egypt, the Ptolemaic kingdom, uh, had control of the land of Judah for uh, uh, about 150 years, maybe a little less than 150 yeah, years. I should interrupt, can, if I can interrupt and just say, when Alexander the Great dies, his kingdom splits into these four sections, and these are... The, the generals that served under Alexander the yes. Great, and these are the families and, and descendants the different geographical of, areas the, of, of the, the generals. The, yeah. the, these are the four horns that Daniel right. talks about. But they're about. still under Greek but influence. They're, they're all Hellenistic kingdoms, mm -hmm. yes. And then uh, uh, somewhere a little after 200 B.C., the, um, another of these uh, heirs of Alexander's empire, the Seleucid Empire, captures the land of Judah away from the Ptolemies, the, the Egyptian uh, kingdom. And one of their uh, kings, um, Antiochus Epiphanes, tries to force the Jews to abandon their religion because he wants to homogenize his empire in the sense of creating one religion so that the empire will be more solid and more stable. Well, and he chooses Hellenism as the vehicle by which to homogenize the empire. In fact, I think we need to define Hellenism. Maybe you ought to define that because maybe to our, our listening audience, they wouldn't be familiar with the Greek, term. Greek culture, right. Greek language, Greek ways, anything Greek. That influences that's philosophy mm -hmm. and religion that's, as well. Nature of God. Well, it's, yeah. a, it's a marriage between the, the ancient civilized world of the Near East and the, the ideas and philosophies of the Greeks, which Alexander imported to all of those lands. And you get the two mixing together and forming this quite unique civilization that we call Hellenism. Uh, uh, imbued with all kinds of Greek ideas, but there's a substratum there of the ancient world that's with it too. Mm -hmm. And the Greeks recognize the importance of that ancient world in, in there. Now, if we go back to Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, he outlawed the practice of Judaism. 
and anyone who was caught practicing Judaism would be killed. And he set up uh, an image of himself as Zeus in the temple in Jerusalem, and he required other sacrilegious things of the Jews, such as offering pigs. And at one point, uh, one family had enough, the, the Maccabean family, the Hasmonean family, and they rebelled against the Syrians. In, uh, the, by this time, they're called Syrians, uh, the uh, Seleucid Empire, mm -hmm. and uh, started a guerrilla warfare in 167 BC. And they were successful. Uh, in throwing off the yoke of the Syrians, who had, uh, and, and this is the first time since the, uh, right. since the Assyrians came in and dominated Judah, that Judah had century. been free of foreign domination. This is around uh, Judah. Uh, Simon Maccabeus declares himself uh, the high priest and king in Jerusalem in 143 B.C. We, we, we probably should say that the the Maccabean revolt against these Seleucid Greek kings is um, first begun by the father, Mattathias. Yes. He has five sons, and then the five sons in turn take over the, the rule of the Hasmonean or the Maccabean family, and it's under Simon and then his son, Jonathan, that w we get the office of high priest and king coming together uh, to um, establish an independent Jewish state. For the first time, I, I, I'd say even for the first time since King David, almost, or King, or King Solomon, Solomon. Uh, all the way back then. So, but it has, it has religious as well as political implications. Yeah, that yeah. it is being driven primarily that they have been banned from being able to practice their religion. Yes. And that, and that Maccabean Jewish state is in existence for about 100 years, from one, about 164 when the temple is rededicated after Antiochus Epiphanes' sacrilege until about 63 B.C. when the Romans have had enough and they come in and they impose their rule on this land of Palestine. It's well, the, I think it, it would be important for us to tell, how in the world did we get Herod then? Yeah, the, the, uh, the Romans are invited in by one of the Hasmoneans who's fighting with his brother for control of the state. And of course, once you invite the Romans in and the camel gets his nose under the tent, uh, you can't stop it. And the Romans come in and impose order. This is Pompey, the famous Pompey, comes in and uh, essentially makes uh, Judea a client state of the Roman Empire. And they set up a client king in the land, and uh, uh, Herod's father becomes a very important person in that client kingdom. And Herod's father marries a Jewish woman and uh, is, in, in his essence is the power behind the throne uh, of this client state of the Romans. In fact, Herod's father even offers some aid and assistance to the likes of Julius Caesar. So really, yes, yeah, he's, yeah, he's, he's currying mm -hmm. favor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, he was very adept at, at uh, choosing the right side in these uh, wars that were going on yeah. between the Romans and others uh, and he in, it well in the to Near East. Son. That's what I'm saying. We're going to see learn that manifest very later. Well. <laughs> But, you know, there's another empire that plays a small part in this at the time, the Parthian Empire in what is now I Iran. And in 40 B.C., they overrun all of the, the, ancient, the, the ancient Near East, and they throw out the Romans and install another Hasmonean as king in Jerusalem. And Herod escapes this and goes to Rome and curries favor with the Romans. And in 37 BC, he comes back with the Roman army and retakes the land. And out of gratitude, the Romans name him King of the Jews. In 37 his, BC. His mother is Jewish, his father is an Edomite. And uh, because of his success, in the name of the Romans, they reward him uh, with this kingship. And thus we have Herod being the king and a client to the Romans. Now, I think it's important that we emphasize what is his Jewishness here? What is his Jewish background? Yeah. Because Jewish, that yeah. becomes very important later to our story. Never, the Jews never take to Herod the Great. They always l look at him sort of as, a, as a, a, a fake Jew, if you will, because the area from which he comes was forced to convert right. to, to Judaism right. under the Maccabees. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so people are always suspicious of his commitment to his, his Judaism, so they never do that. And in fact, they look at Herod as nothing more than Romans, Rome's puppet. And so, for all intents and purposes, they regard themselves as under Roman control. And that then leads us to this idea of the messianic expectation is they're looking primarily for the great liberator 
not just the spiritual right, that, that redeemer. Now, now a lot of that has been lost because of the political circumstances well, I, I and the climate the time, of the, the day. The Maccabean period has become glamorized by right. that time as yes. well. Yeah. It was the time they can say that we had our own people ruling us, and in reality, it became pretty corrupt. It, it was about a hundred year period, and it, it was fairly corrupt. They, they kicked out the, the legitimate high priest from the temple and installed one of their own Hasmoneans Who as the, the high priest. Who had the most money, right. too, yeah. became he, a big yes. boss. The office. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and I think that becomes important for us then to understand what we might call the major sects that we read about in the New Testament that have their roots in this time period Can as well. Can I go back to, sure. to, to the question that brought up this historical discourse, and that is, what kind of a Messiah are the Jews then expecting in first century Palestine? And the answer is the kind of a Messiah, the kind of anointed one that King David and King Solomon were. They were great political leaders. They were great military leaders. And so the Jews in the first century are expecting a kind of a Messiah that will come in. He'll clean up this military political mess. He'll drive the Romans out. Uh, the, he'll allow the Jews to come out from underneath the, th the thumb of Rome and will establish the kind of a Davidic kingdom that we saw back in the Old Testament under King David. Which was the most remarkable that's empire right. in the entire that, ancient that's Near the, East. That's the idyllic past. That, that is the golden age of, of mm -hmm. Israel's history. That's the age to which uh, I think it's fair to say even Jews today look with some longing that we can establish the kind of a Davidic kingdom. And so that's what the Jews are looking for. Now, don't you think, though, before we go to this next part of the scribes and the Pharisees and, and the Sadducees and all of that that come out of this historical context as well, but wouldn't you say that this political climate of the day clouds the theology as well? Oh, there's no question about it. Yes. That's, the, that's the problem is that, uh, that all the history impacts their theology and, and, and they got big problems. Yes. When, when the Hasmoneans take over, they, they uh, accommodate themselves through the course of time to the Hellenistic culture That's and right. the Hellenistic ways and eventually become uh, Hellenistic in all respects. And the people, though, themselves uh, like the old-time religion. They like the Old Testament. They don't want this, this Hellenism coloring their theology. And they can tell very clearly that what they're teaching is not what That's right. the prophets taught of and, old. And they start a popular movement, a, a conservative, religious, old-time movement that uh, becomes the Pharisees of the New Testament. They're the ones who are, who are uh, against the Hellenization that's going on and that's introduced by the Maccabees and, and, uh, or the Hasmoneans. They're the same people. The Hasmoneans themselves, in their accommodations then, become, in, in their Hellenization and their subservience to, these, uh, to Rome and, and to Hellenistic culture, they become the Sadducees of the New Testament. More of an arist aristocratic. Uh, aristocratic status quo, mm -hmm. don't rock the boat. Uh, Claim uh, lineage uh, pa is an pact, important. Pact right. with the priests. Uh, right. A, a, the, a, the liberal, a liberalization of the interpretation of the theology of, of the, the Old And the Pharisees are going to be the stricter interpretation of it. Yes. And, in, and, and because none of, neither of those two groups are, are, are in the business of freeing the Jews from foreign domination, you get the zealots and other people like that who are politically minded and want to look back to the age of the Maccabees, of the first Maccabees, and, and recreate that with the Romans, that is, throw off the, the Roman ro uh, yoke as the Maccabees had thrown off the Syrian Seleucid uh, yoke 150 years before the time of Christ. So, so, so I was going to say, then that means in a lot of ways the people are looking at Jesus through political eyes rather than religious eyes. That's exactly the point. And so when they say, when he says, my kingdom is not of this world, that's not the message they want to hear. Right. He's saying you, you, you're, you're searching for the wrong kind of a Messiah. You've misunderstood the basic nature of, of things. So we can kind of summarize and say, uh, when Alexander the Great came to the ancient Near East and introduced Hellenism, some good things were introduced because people then were, were willing to listen to other ideas, but bad things were introduced because we get um, the uh, development of the different parties and sects as reactions against or sometimes in favor of this Hellenism. Then this leads to an apostate form of Israelite religion or an apostate form of Judaism. And when the Savior is born into the world, uh, a lot of things are messed up with their theology, and they just don't 
understand it's the kind a little of bit like the, the the choices that Joseph Smith has in in 1820 which church should I join yeah. and uh, I don't think he suspected when he went into the woods that the answer would be none of them and I suspect that there weren't very many people in Christ's day mm -hmm. who came up with the answer none of the things that are available are are the solution to well, the, to and the it, question. And it's reinforced the importance of the written word and that becomes even more, like especially for the Pharisees, to hold on to, to hang on to. And, and that's one of the good things the Pharisees have. You know, we, it, right. has it, it has its upside and downside, but it, it, the Pharisees are not all bad. Uh, we, and, and yet we need to understand their origin and their roots so that we can understand what Jesus is condemning and, and why, what, and and why he's just espousing. Why that's they right. couldn't accept him when he came. I, I think we'll draw this portion of our uh, discussion to a close by saying Jesus was born into the world in the meridian of time. But that meridian dispensation, according to President J. Reuben Clark, was the habitation of some of the most terrible passions that were let loose in world history. For more information on this program, visit our website at broadcasting.byu.edu. This program was made possible by the Division of Continuing Education at Brigham Young University.